John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Well, hi there. It's good to see you again. My name is Stephen King, and this is my friend John Noe. We are putting on a continuing Bible study series called Greater Than We Believe. Mm-hmm. If you've been tuning in, we hope you have. Uh, the last few weeks we've been speaking on a subject based on this book here, but written by John Noe back in 2011, called Hell Yes, Hell No. And the whole hell discussion is very, very um, controversial. We've been trying to... Uh, Go in and do some uh, uh, de- explanations of, of words and meanings and histories of things. And uh, if you haven't been re- watching this discussion up till now, I would in- encourage you to go back to start with number 200. Uh, that's where we started this discussion mm-hmm. uh, a few weeks ago. Today is uh, number 205. And the name of our uh, discussion today is called Lake of Fire and More. And so, uh, what is Lake of Fire? Well, let's find out. John, what can you tell us? <laughs> but first. But first. <laughs> let's do Tataris. Tataris, okay. Who knows what that means? Uh, I don't know. Well, a lot of I people don't know. Word. It's called the pit, but I mean, other than that, I don't know. <laughs> well, there's a lot of confusion about yeah. this. Uh, but it is our fourth and final biblical word, word that's usually translated in some versions, like okay this one, NIV, as hell, uh, but the original in the Greek, it's Tartarus. Okay. And it's found only once in the Bible, Stephen. Okay. Uh, and never used in the Septuagint. Hmm. Uh, Young's literal renders, uh, Young's literal translation yes. of the Bible, uh, renders it directly as Tartarus. And furthermore, this single usage only refers to it as a place of incarceration. Hmm. This, uh, this incarceration is of who? Hmm. Well, if you translate it as hell, <laughs> which a lot of, then that would include a lot of folks. Right. Would it not, based, folks? <laughs> based on the way they translated hell everywhere yeah. else. But it only incarcerates fallen angels and demons. Okay. Awaiting further judgment of God. And human souls are never mentioned. Isn't that something? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, for example, would you read um, let's give it the, the one place in the New Testament where Tartarus is used, 2 Peter 2.4. Would you please read the NIV version of this? 2 Peter 2.4 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Red flag. <laughs> That's Tataris. Yes, that's what should say Tataris. Putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Oh, and five? No, no, okay. that, that's fire. That, that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. That's enough. That's what we wanted to point out. But that's the one and only. And that's he, the one and only. And, and that's Tataris. And uh, in the Greek, paradoxically, it's not a noun. The actual word there is a participle. Now, participle, for some of you who've forgotten your uh, uh, early uh, high school English, high school English, a participle is making a verb out of a noun. And that's what it is there. So scholar uh, Ron McKay, and I want you to read this, if you would, for us, okay. page uh, 240s. To, uh, excuse me, 425, he recognized this linguistic fact and contributes this bit of wisdom, if you would. He says, I have transliterated the Greek participle Tartarus here because... So that's the, that's the participle, is Tartarus, Tartarize. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Because its exact meaning is debatable. It is translated hell in both the RSV and the NIV, but this is its only occurrence in the New Testament, and it is not a noun. The Greek text literally says that God delivered them to pits of nether gloom, or gloomy dungeons, having uh, tartarized them. Whether a final state of... Punishment- Actually, that's tar 
Tartarized. Tartarized, yeah. Car tied to raise them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whether a final. So see how that verb has been nounized? No. <laughs> Not. Tartarized. Okay. Yeah. Um, whether a final state of punishment or an interim state of punishment is indicated here is not specified. However, it is clear that the punishment is concurrently in progress and will continue until the parousia and the final day of judgment. Oops, there's another little thing. Mm-hmm. We, we've already addressed that, so mm-hmm. we, won't, we, we don't need to get to that. Stephen, with no other biblical use, Adam Clark's commentary recommends... Quote, we must have recourse to Greek writers for its meaning of the Tartarize Mm -hmm. or Tartarus. And of course, relying on Greek writers means opening a can of mystical worms, Mm -hmm. (laughs) he says. So Clark lists several Greek writers, but focuses on the Iliad, uh, which was written 720 B.C., uh, in which Homer writes without any explanation just this bit of mumbo mumbo gumbo, Mm -hmm. threatening, quote, threatening any of the gods who should presume to assist either the Greek Greeks or the Trojans, that he should either come back wounded to heaven or be sent to Tartarus. Mm. And that's all he says. Don't tell us anything more about it or whatever. Clark's commentary next compares Peter's use here mm-hmm. of Tartarus with Homer's mythological prison thusly. He says, on the whole, then, in St. Peter, it is the same to throw into Tartarus. In Homer only, rectifying the Pope's mistake of Tartarus being in the bowls, or bowels, I guess that word is, of the earth, and reoccurring to its original sense of that word above explained, which, when applied to spirits, must be interpreted spiritually, and thus I will import that God cast the up apostate angels out of his presence into that blackness of darkness. Hmm. Now you know everything you need to know about Zertaris. <laughs> That's all we know. Uh, McLaren, in his book, The Last Word and the Word After That, uh, <clears throat> Uh, says he thinks that Tartarus was the place in Greek thought below Hades, Hmm. also a place of divine punishment. But in reality, Stephen, all we know is that Tartarus is wherever God sent the evil sinning angels. Mm -hmm. That's all we know. And perhaps it was a name for an unrighteous compartment uh, in Hades, as as McLaren kind of believes it might be. But the one thing we can say for sure is, in the Bible, Tartarus is not a noun. It's to Tartarize, is the word actually used there in the Greek. And it's a participle that is traditionally mistranslated as the noun hell. Hmm. All right. Enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, cool let's, is let's, look, let's look at some other hell associated phraseology and terminology. In our last video, and in my books and so forth like that, I always use the basic hermeneutical principle of letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Yes. Or, as the reformer said, sola scripture. scripture. To show that the phrase, for example, in one of our previous videos, uh, like unquenchable fire and so forth, which is frequently associated with hell, but notably in the Bible, it is never used for anything other than a this world national judgment. And that fire always ended. Right. And in this video, we will address other biblical expressions and images that have likewise been misconstrued. And over the centuries, most of us have been told and taught that these expressions and images literally refer to suffering unendingly, unquestionably, consciously, punishment, torment, and an otherworldly afterlife place called hell. (laughs) Uh, Lest this assertion uh, is right. Let's test it. Okay. And see if it is well founded or unfounded. 
Okay. Sound familiar? Sure. Or acceptable or sure. worth pursuing? Absolutely. All right. First, you ever hear of weeping and gnashing of teeth? Oh, yeah. Big time. So when you think of weeping and gnashing of teeth, and when you think of weeping and gnashing of teeth, what image prop? What, what people thought? think of people being roasted in a fire and they're crying, you know, it's just the, well, it, that it, fiery burning hell. In hell. Culture. Yes, that's what they think of. All right. Jesus employed this phrase several times. Mm -hmm. He did. Yes. Matthew 8, 12, 13, 42, and 50, 22, 13, 24, 51, 25, 30, and Luke 13, 28. I mentioned all those because I don't want you to think I'm making this stuff up. Uh -huh. <laughs> But in the Old Testament, this language is also used extensively to speak of this world events. For instance, in Isaiah 22.12, weeping speaks of the time Jerusalem would be destroyed by Babylon in a national, this world, judgment. In Job 16.9, King James' gnashing of teeth speaks of an adversary about to kill its victim in a this world situation. In NIV, it is God who gnashes his teeth. Hmm. Psalm 38.16, 37.12, Lamentations 2.16, and also Acts 7.54. The psalmist used it from the victim standpoint. In Psalm 1.12.10, as of this world, victim. Mm -hmm. James 1.5 uses it to depict the weeping of the rich in fear of God's coming, this world national judgment on Jerusalem, A.D. 66 through 70. Also, see James 5, uh, 5 through 9. In John, in the Revelation, 18.9, he adopts similar weeping language to speak of a coming national judgment and impending destruction uh, coming shortly this world. Why? So why in the world should Jesus' usages of this be any different? Unless he clarified that he was using it differently in which he did not do. Hmm. He was using it the same for a this world type event. Second, you ever hear of fire and brimstone? Oh, yeah. So what do you think of? What do you think most Christians think of? Sunday you... morning Baptist preacher up on the river preaching fire and brimstone, going to hail, <laughs> going to burn, turn or burn. <laughs> uh, its uses six times. Revelation 9, 17, and 18, Revelation 14, 10, 19, 20, 20, 10, and 21, 8, six times. And Luke 17, 29 employs this terminology to refer to the destruction of Sodom. Mm -hmm. Sodom. So. Uh, a this world event. Similarly, Isaiah 30, 33 used this language for the coming of a national judgment on Assyria. In Isaiah 34, 9, used it for the future national judgment of Edom. Get the picture? All this world stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 11, 6, for a general judgment on the wicked, this world. Ezekiel 38, 22, for the national judgment on, on Gog, whatever that was, a pagan nation or something opposed to God, but this world. And some believe Revelation 14, 9 through 11, speaks of a coming national judgment on Jerusalem this world. Surprisingly then, the Greek word translated as brimstone or sulfur is the Greek word theion, which comes from the word, re, root word theos. Hmm. Now you know what theos means? God. God. Or theos for God-like. Could there be anything hmm. any more different <laughs> uh, than hell for this? Moreover, this tidbit, this on this tidbit, we cover the lake of fire shortly. Mm -hmm. But we got a few more th little other phrases to address okay. before them. Third phrase: outer darkness. Yes. What do you think of when you think of outer darkness? In Revelation, it talks about being cast out of the city gates into the outer darkness. A lot of people think of hell. Yeah. They think of it as both fire. Mm -hmm. And outer darkness. Well, if you have fire, you have a lot of light. Yeah, a lot of light. <laughs> yes. how, does, how does that work? Yeah. 
Well, okay, we'll get there. Okay. Okay, okay. But Jesus spoke of outer darkness three in three places, Matthew 8, 12, 22, 13, and 25, 30. The NIV translates this as uh, outside into outer darkness. But why wouldn't the original hearers of Jesus' words about outer darkness have understood it as outer space or the sky mm. or, so, or something above? After all, that outer darkness was literally in front of them above their heads and before their eyes every night, was it not? Mm -hmm. Why would they think of outer darkness being anything any different? Also, wouldn't fire, as I mentioned earlier, I guess I preceded myself yeah, here, did. Why, wouldn't fire in hell produce light mm -hmm. and not darkness? McLaren, where's McLaren's book? McLaren, his book, The Last Days, uh, pondered this conundrum and suggests that, quote, all these images can't be taken literally hmm. at the same time. I mean, you can't have literal fire and darkness in, at the same time, right. he questions. In support of the traditional view of hell, however, in Morgan and Peterson's book, Hell Under Fire, the authors here uh, offer this explanation. See what you think of this explanation. Various descriptions contain elements in tension with each other. Well, these would be certainly be in tension. Sure. Darkness and fire or light. Those descriptions are in all likelihood, drum roll, metaphorical. Yes. <laughs> We kick the can down to metaphorical here. Uh, metaphorical. Next, however, they dismiss this literal translation of mixed metaphors by washing their hands of the problem and conceding that, quote, we are not under constraint to resolve how utter darkness can also have perpetually burning flames, end quote. Yep. Put it away. Hmm. Out, out, damn spot. In their opinions, metaphors are used precisely in order to describe realities greater than themselves. Hmm. Of course, these authors also are quick to assure us, Stephen, that, quote, hell itself is not metaphorical, mm -hmm. but real. You know, some, yeah. just switch gears, you know, whichever way you want to go. It's just that these vivid metaphors point to a reality, they explain, more awful than themselves, indeed terrible beyond words. Hmm. Timothy Keller agrees. In his book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism, he says, we have to hunt to find this explanation. Or, excuse me, I say that. We have to hunt to find it because it's buried all the way back here in his footnotes at, at the very end. And there he volunteers, quote, each metaphor suggests one aspect of the experience of hell. For example, fire, he tells us, tells us of the disintegration while darkness tells us of the isolation. Having said that, that does not at all imply that heaven or hell themselves are metaphor. Forces hmm. his hands of it. Interestingly, and to the contrary, three expressions of outer darkness are also in conjunction with the expression weeping and gnashing, or gnashing of teeth. And as we have seen, this language is associated with of this world event, mm -hmm. particularly national judgments and impending destruction. And destruction, of course, would certainly be characterized as a darkening, would it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, today, for example, brothers and sisters, we, see th we say things like, the lights turned out, or the stage or screen went black. dark yeah. or black, meaning there was nothing to be seen. Right. But the bottom line about the exact nature of hell is, according to Galley in his book, God Wins, the Bible doesn't give us much beyond these few little bare truths. Hmm. Fire, darkness, conscious torment, annihilation, it's not as clear. Hmm. Sad to say. Okay, fourth. 
Have you heard of the abyss? Oh, yes. And the bottomless pit? Mm, yes. And what do you think of when you hear that? Mm. Same stuff we've been talking about. Yeah. <laughs> this mis fourth mysterious expression is used nine times in the New Testament. Should I mention all that? I guess I should because I have been mentioned before. Okay, so sorry about it, but here they are for some of you want to know. This mentioned in Luke 8.31, Romans 10.7, Revelation 9.1 and 2, 9.11, 11.7, 17.8 and 21 and 3. That's 20 verses 1 and 3. Okay. The Septuagint, the 2nd century B.C. Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses this term in Genesis 1-2 to speak of the origi original deep and darkness of the earth and its waters at the beginning of creation. Mm -hmm. And it is never translated as hell. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's a metaphor, here's that word again, for judgment and punishment and torment and even the grave. The Old Testament equivalent Hebrew word is, is tehome, T-E-H-O-M-E. And it is used 36 times and translated as the, the great deep or depths as in Genesis 1-2, for example. Mm -hmm. Also in Job 28-14, 38-16, Psalm 33-7, and 36-6. These are references to the deepest part of the sea. Mm -hmm. And figuratively understood, according to David Chilton, if you would, would you read from page 244 there, the place I got marked there, uh, Figuratively understood as the farthest extreme from heaven. So Chilton elaborates on this use. He says, and Jonah spoke of the abyss in terms of excommunication from God's presence, a banishment from the temple, the, uh, which was from Jonah 2, 2 through 6, the domain of the dragon, Job 41, 31, Psalm 148, 7, and Revelation 11, 7, and 17, 8. The prison of the demons, Luke 8, 31. Um, and the realm of the dead, Romans 10, 7. They're all called by the name abyss. The New Testament application of this term is best understood, in my opinion, Stephen, as being the spirit realm confinement area or prison or darkness abode of demonic spirits. But... It must not be confused with Sheol mm -hmm. or Hades or Gehenna, to which it is never conjoined or equated. And we must reemphasize that this is never translated properly as hell. Right. So with that clarity <laughs> or confusion, further confused or clarified, whichever it might be, we now come to the lake of fire. Yes. So if you thought those, that explanation and, and that uh, re revealing or unveiling was something, wait to hear this one. Mm -hmm. The lake of fire. Finally, Stephen, is this our place of hell? Hmm. Notably, the expression lake of fire is only found in the Bible's last book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And most Christians assume that this lake is hell. No doubt. Chan and Sprinkle in their book, Erasing Hell. No doubt. This is because, quote, the most well-known imagery used to describe hell is fire. Mm -hmm. Yet many theologians and scholars admit they don't know what the lake of fire is. But I do. Mm -hmm. And shortly you will too. Mm -hmm. As we use scripture to interpret scripture. Yes, and so does so scripture. Yes. So stay tuned here. Uh, writing in Jets, the... Uh, uh, Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, and it's one of the most, uh, the world's most prestigious uh, theological journals, conservative, evangelical. Theologian Glenn Peoples confesses that, quote, whatever the lake of fire signifies, it must be a fate that can be applied to both personal entities, such as the devil and lost human beings, as well as to impersonal entities, such as the beast. Hmm. Well, thanks for that. 
Now we now we know all about the lake of fire, right? Yep. Warning. Red flag. Warning, what you are about to hear may be more shocking than the little known etymology of hell. Yes. <laughs> which which we have previously addressed. Most likely. Revelation's lake of fire is totally opposite in meaning from what we think of as hell. Yes. Does this seem impossible? <laughs> Let's see. First, Stephen, would you read from Revelation, verse 20, uh, verses 13 through 15, if you would, please. Revelation 20, 13 through 15 says, <clears throat> The sea gave up the dead in it that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Death and Hades. Hades. The lake of fire is the second death. Wow. And uh, 21 8 also, while you're there. 21 verse 8 says, But the cowardly. The unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Now that would include you and I, all right? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe not. It says uh, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This Ooh. is the second death. Ooh, wow. Man, isn't that something? Well, let's agree that Hades is either now or will be someday located ultimately in this lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And the Hades was the holding place of, uh, of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Yes. Dead, right? Right. Without moral distinction. But, but there was two compartments there. Secondly, let's especially note that Gehenna and Tartarus are not thrown into this lake of fire. Hmm. Are they? No. And those are often translated as hell. Yes. And they're not thrown into it. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? Although many today equate Gehenna and, and, and with, with both hell and the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. But they are not thrown in. Uh, in his book, More Than Conquerors, uh, William Hendricks, son, uh, asserts that after the judgment, Hell is called the lake of fire. Well-known theologian. But how does he know this to be true? He doesn't say. He just makes the assertion. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it lacks biblical support. Right. Third, death in Hades and equivalent Sheol being thrown into this lake of fire does not necessitate their termination or annihilation. But it does change their location. Yes. Fourth, the lake of fire is contained in a book filled with signs and symbols. Yes? Yes. Revelation? Yes. Filled with signs and symbols. The signs and the symbols aren't the reality, but they point to a reality. Right. A sign and a symbol outside of uh, our city, Indianapolis, on 465 that goes all around the city, mm -hmm. have signs all over it pointing inside Indianapolis. Right. The sign is not Indianapolis, right. <laughs> but it points to sign. Well, that's what signs and symbols do. So should it not be surprising that uh, it too is a sign and a symbol, the lake of fire, a sign and a symbol pointing to some literal reality other and greater than itself? But the book of Revelation does not decipher hmm. this imagery for us as it does some of its other signs and symbols, for example. And many prominent Christian theologians, as we've seen, connect fire, this fire, the lake, to hell. However, by using the analogy of Scripture, once again, letting Scripture interpret Scripture, we can again gain a better insight, brothers and sisters, in my opinion. Fifthly, the book of Revelation contains both this lake of fire and also a river of... Are water of life. Water of life, okay. Revelation 21, 
22.1 and, and 17. Generally, most of us think of a lake as being a large body of water, mm -hmm. right? And a large, and larger than a river, mm -hmm. right? And since many rivers flow into lakes. Hence, a lake of fire would be a lot of fire. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Sure. Would you agree? I hope so. And from other scriptures, we know that Jesus is over, often spoke of as being living water. Mm -hmm. John 4, 10 through 12. And the Holy Spirit as being streams or rivers of living water. John 7, 38 through 39. In like manner, the prophet Daniel's vision of God's throne in heaven mm -hmm. contains this. Daniel 7, 9 through 10. His throne was flaming with fire, mm -hmm. and its wheels were all ablaze. Ablaze with what? Fire. fire. <laughs> A river of fire was flowing out from before him. Again, Dan I'm not making this up, folks. Daniel 7, 9 through 10. The writer of Hebrews further tells us that our God is a consuming fire. fire. Oh, goodness gracious. Hebrews 12, 29. Also see Deuteronomy 2, 24 and Isaiah 33, 14. And in many places in the Old Testament, fire is associated with God. I got a whole bunch of yeah, I'll give them to you. Exodus twenty four seventeen, Deuteronomy thirty two twenty two, Isaiah thirty twenty seven, thirty three fourteen, Leviticus ten one through two, Ezekiel one twenty seven and eight two, Hosea Hosea six five and Luke twenty twelve forty nine. Likewise. Mm -hmm. God speaks out of the midst of fire. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 4:12 uh, and 15, 30 and 33, 36, 5, let's see, I'll get these right. And 36, 5, 4, 22, 24, 26, 9, 10, and 10, 14. You got all those? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the New Testament, fire is commonly used as a reference to God or his messengers. Revelation 1, 14, 2, 18, 10, 1, 15, 2, 19, 12, Matthew 3, 11, Luke 12, 49. Am I boring you all out there? <laughs> Acts 12, Two, excuse me, Acts 2, 3, and 7, 30, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, and 15, Hebrews 1, 7. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. These and many other verses confirm, even as Sharon Baker in Raising Hell, confirm that fire comes from God, yes. surrounds God, and is God. For our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Amen. This lake is also filled with brimstone. The lake of fire and brimstone. See Revelation 20, 10, 21, 8, and 14, 14, 10. Let's recall again that the Greek word for brimstone or sulfur is theion. Mm -hmm. And this word comes from theos, yes. derived from God. And this word may well this word may well define the nature or character of this fire, mm -hmm. would it not? Mm -hmm. And it's derived from the wheat word theos, which we've already talked about for God, and theos meaning godlike or divine. Therefore, by analogy in Scripture, the lake of fire is most probably a symbol for God Himself. Yes, and His judgments. Mm -hmm. And death and Hades, as well as Satan, the beast, the false prophet, and anyone's name not found written in the book of life, Revelation 19, 20, 20, 10, uh, 20, 13 through 15, and 21, 8, were or are to be thrown into this lake of fire, which is being thrown into God. Not hell. Mm -hmm. Not hell. In future videos, we will expand upon the many possible applications, positively and negatively, mm -hmm. and durations of this understanding of revelations, the lake of fire. Sixth, and I'm getting close to a close here. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. If this understanding is correct, 
then death and Hades are now or someday, depending on your eschatological view, or someday, uh, are, are not in a place of separation or absence from God, but are in God himself. Hmm. Perhaps this is why the third angel in Revelation chapter 14, when discussing the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation, further reveals that he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels hmm. and in the presence of the Lamb, who is Jesus, Revelation 14, 10 through 11. Does that sound like hell to you? No. <laughs> if this place of torment is not hell, i.e. a place of eternal separation from God, as it is traditionally presented, mm -hmm. what does this verse mean? <laughs> For one, this judgment may not be as pleasant of an experience as we would think. <laughs> In this world, or in the afterlife, uh, if for no other reason, then it is, a dreadful ha it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Yes. In this world? Yes. Or even in heaven? Yes. Hebrews 10.31. But it could also mean an afterlife of refinement, cleansing, and purification by fire. Yes. By God. Furthermore, it is most likely that everyone is going to get some fire <laughs> in the afterlife. You, mm -hmm. me, and thee. Mm -hmm. ah, see you again, Mark 9, 49, especially 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14, and 1 Peter 1, 7. And we'll have much more to say about all this possibility later on as we proceed. But seventh, and I think that's finally, yeah. And regardless of your eschatological view, the lake of fire is the final, superseding, surviving, ultimate, and ongoing reality where death and Hades reside in some form. Mm hmm as you have seen and heard, brothers and sisters, we can make a stronger case that the lake of fire is God himself and in some way, form, or dimension than, than, than we can uh, uh, have it being a place of separation from him called hell. Right. Then what about punishment in the afterlife? Hmm. Is there not something to be feared here? Only one verse in the Bible couples these two phrases together. And Jesus warned his hearers, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Hmm. Matthew 25, 46. Traditionalists argue that this if it, we argue this way, if no eternal punishment, then no eternal life. Mm -hmm. Whatever eternal means for life, it must mean for punishment. And granted, the same Greek word, aeanos, is used for both words, translated as eternal here. But where does this punishment take place? The verse does not tell us mm -hmm. there. Nor does Daniel... 12.2 or 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, which presents similar scenarios. What then prevents this punishment from taking place in the lake of fire, mm -hmm. which burns, purifies, mm -hmm. clarifies, cleanses, so forth, which as we have seen may be God himself mm -hmm. and not a place of separation from him called hell. And for what purposes or purpose? Again, we'll have much more to say about this and these afterlife possibilities and prospects in future coming videos. Mm. So stay tuned. Thank you, John. And I'm finished. You're finished. Well, that was a lot to take in, but um, I wonder how many of you out there were guessing what that lake of fire was going to be. <laughs> I remember the first time I've, I read that, and it made so much sense to me, though. Um, you can look at a prospector, a gold miner, 
uh, picking up nuggets and things like that and some of them are really big chunks of gold and some of them are little specks in a thing the thing is they're all valuable to him but they're not valuable until they've been cleaned up and refined mm -hmm. they got to put them through the furnace melt away all the all the crud and the, the, the dross that comes to the top gets skimmed off and then what you have left is the pure gold mm -hmm. and so we are all valuable to God uh, he let his son die for us the fact of the matter is is that somewhere along the line somehow however this works in heaven we all have to uh, have everything removed from us so we've had our sins forgiven through Jesus sacrifice but whatever whatever's left whatever process may be left to make us pure uh, I don't know what that is but we know that God we have a song called the refiner's fire that God is the uh, a refiner he's the refiner and he's gonna test us all by fire the Bible says we'll be salted with with fire so there's a lot more there than meets the eye and and it all is positive though it's not negative and never called hell no never called hell never said this is going to be torture forever because Pro properly trans you. properly right. trans exactly right so anyway um you may have to watch this one again <laughs> to, to catch it all but we're looking forward john to continue with this discussion next week video number 206 will be con called concluding thoughts Interesting to see what you have to say there. And uh, I hope you come back. And uh, we've still got a lot more in the book here to discuss besides just the hell portion. There's more to go. So uh, come back and see us. God bless you. And we'll see you then. Bye. Okay.